We turn now to the front part of the Green Hymnal to page 77 for the brief order of confession and forgiveness. We begin as we live in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. First John chapter 1 declares that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So now in the certainty of that promise, let us together in a moment of silence confess before God whatever sin or guilt is on our conscience today. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only begotten Son to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sin. And therefore, as a member with you of the priesthood of all believers, but by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, I declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Our hymn of praise today is I Love Your Kingdom, Lord, number 368. You may be seated.
Please join me in praying the prayer of the day as it's printed in the order of service. Almighty God, through your Son, Jesus Christ, you gave the holy apostles many gifts and bound them together in the church, the very body of Christ. Hold us also in that holy fellowship that extends across space and time. Through your church, equip us with the gifts we need to witness boldly to the power of Jesus' forgiveness and the hope of the resurrection to eternal life. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, who reigns with you in the Holy Spirit. Amen. The first reading today is from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 37 to 47. Following the dramatic witness of Peter and the other apostles on Pentecost, this reading records the founding and life of the earliest Christian church. Note how much the life of the church today still reflects those initial practices. This reading is the text for the sermon today. Reading from Acts. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation, So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. The second lesson today is from Ephesians chapter four, verses seven and eleven through sixteen. This passage describes how God works through the church to grant gifts to all all of his people, as he did for the apostles on Pentecost, and also to preserve us in the truth of the gospel amidst the welter of false teachings in the world, reading from Ephesians. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. The gifts he gave were that some would be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until all of us come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the son of god to maturity to the measure of the full stature of Christ we must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine by people's trickery by their craftiness and deceit, deceitful scheming But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knitted together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly, promotes the body's growth in building itself up in love. The word of the Lord. At this time, I would like to invite children forward for faith seeds. Good morning, everyone. Do I have any kids coming up for faith seeds? We'll wait for a few stragglers. <laughs> well, good morning, guys. Thank you for coming up. Um, today I have my friend Kristen here to help me with my lesson. Um, my first question for you is, do you notice anything similar about me and Kristen? You might notice that we're both wearing blue somewhere on our clothes. We're both wearing white. 
Um, we both kind of have dark brown hair. Here's a little darker, but do you notice any differences that we have? We, well, she's wearing her hair up. She's wearing glasses. I'm not wearing glasses. I have my hair down. Um, she's wearing sandals. I'm wearing my closed-toed shoes. But despite all the differences and simila similarities that we have, there's one thing that we share, and we both love Jesus. In the Bible reading today, one of the verses says that all who believed were together and had all things in common. On Sundays, we all gather here because we love Jesus, and our faith is very important to us. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you for everyone who is here today to hear your word. I thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to save us and give us eternal life. Help us to love those around us despite our similarities and differences. And also remember the one similarity that ties us all together. In your name, amen. You guys can go back to your seats. Then Jesus and his disciples arrived at the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. As he stepped out on land, the man of the city who had demons met him. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he did not live in a house but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he fell down before him and shouted at the top of his voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles that he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? He said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. They begged him not to order them to go back into the abyss. Now there on the hillside, a large herd of swine was feeding, and the demons begged Jesus to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When the swine herd saw what had happened, they ran off and told it in the city and in the country. Then people came out to see what had happened. And when they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told them how the one who had been possessed by demons had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city how much Jesus had done for him. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. <coughs> Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Heavenly Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know why exactly, but from the very beginning of my ministry, I've had an instinctive distrust of all of the fads and trends that periodically arise in the church. Each one promising to resolve all of our struggles and to create thriving congregations. And I recognize, of course, the need for some innovation, but over the years, 
I've seen enough fads come and go to remain suspicious of whatever the latest new thing is. The one current fad that's driving me a little batty is churches with odd one-word names that are only lightly connected to Christianity. For example, Elevation Church. Sounds like an outreach to pilots and mountain climbers. Others I've seen include Creative Church and Celebration Church, both of which are fine characteristics but could equally describe an art school or a fitness center. Perhaps strangest of all is Freshwater Church, which makes me wonder if they're stalking right on in the baptistry. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong, I do not mean in any way to disparage those churches or their ministries. I have no doubt they're filled with devout believers trying to reach a culture that's increasingly distant from any sense of Christian tradition. And if putting an obscure, chirpy name on a church helps with that, more power to it. I'm just not convinced that it's a particularly effective evangelism strategy. Nevertheless, if we were to adopt the one word, slightly obscure, obscure naming strategy, I could get on board with one option. Although it applies not just to a single congregation, but to the whole Christian church on earth. We call them, really should call it, essential church. Because that would lift up how absolutely necessary the church is. Despite its mundane and often unimpressive appearance in God's will for his people. And rest assured, unlike my reaction to the current church naming fad, that's not just my opinion. It's the inescapable conclusion of today's reading from Acts. As we explore those 30 years that changed the world. Over the last three weeks, we have celebrated three great church festivals. First Ascension Sunday, when Jesus withdrew his physical presence and returned to the right hand of the Father. Then the day of Pentecost, when Christ sent the Holy Spirit, just as he had promised, to maintain his resurrected presence among all his people. And last week, Holy Trinity Sunday, when Pastor Dave explained the amazing perichoresis or interrelationship of the triune God, which Peter revealed in his sermon on Pentecost Day. Well, the passage that Andrew read just a moment ago comes immediately after Peter's Pentecost sermon and reports the crowd's reaction to it. It's the natural follow-up to the great events of Pentecost. And yet, oddly enough, it's a text that's rarely read in worship. Even though it could well be assigned to this Sunday every year as a fourth consecutive festival day to mark the birthday of the church. Now you may know that Pentecost Day is often called the birthday of the church and all these events happened on Pentecost. But the festival of Pentecost tends to focus so much on the dramatic coming of the Holy Spirit that the actual founding and life of the earliest Christian community escapes notice. It isn't until now, at the very end of Acts 2, that we find Luke's report of how the church actually got started is the inevitable outcome of the Holy Spirit's coming on Pentecost. And what a report it is. First of all, Luke's note notes that it was not the dramatic fireworks of the Holy Spirit's arrival, but Peter's preaching that captivated the crowd. When 
when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said, what should we do? In the main tool that the Holy Spirit uses, there and then, is the proclamation of the good news of Jesus, crucified and risen. In fact, that's just how the Augsburg Confession, the founding document of the Lutheran Church, describes the Holy Spirit's work. It says, to obtain saving faith, God instituted the office of preaching, giving the gospel and the sacraments. And through these, he gives the Holy Spirit, who produces faith where and when he wills in those who hear the gospel. The vital role of God's word proclaimed makes it essential that God's people gather as the church to hear that good news preached. Peter then answered the crowd's question by declaring, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. The gateway into Christ's church then and now is Holy baptism. A sacrament whose simplicity stands in inverse proportion to its importance. In baptism, Christ graciously grants us forgiveness of sins, new life in Him, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is the most significant event ever to occur in any of our lives. And that makes the church, or baptism is administered in accordance with the gospel, absolutely essential. Luke then reports that no fewer than 3,000 people were baptized on that first day of the church. But that's not all. Those first Christians then immediately joined together in community as a congregation. They formed, or were formed into, a church. See, holy baptism was never meant to be an isolated event that merely reserves our ticket into heaven. But rather, it drives us into the life of the church so that faith can be nurtured and sustained through word and sacrament. And did you notice that the four activities which Luke says bound that first Christian congregation together are precisely what the church has continued to do right down to our day? They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayer. Those core functions of the church, preaching and teaching, the mutual conversation and consolation of the saints, the Lord's Supper, and prayer, haven't changed since Pentecost Day. Despite all the dramatic changes in the world around us, and you all are living proof that they still work. The only logical conclusion is that the spiritual practices which the Holy Spirit inspired those first believers to do are essential to the church. And finally, Luke notes that that same pattern then carried forward as the defining characteristic of the Christian church. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. Now, if that sounds maybe a bit too idealistic, too much like happily ever after, Gerhard Kroll points out that the term generous hearts would be better translated as simplicity of heart. And 
And then he tartly observes, simplicity is not simple-mindedness, no stupidity, but the opposite of duplicity and doubt. The church must keep its priorities straight. Well, that's the same morning St. Paul gave the Ephesians in the second lesson for today. We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. Ongoing participation in the church is essential, not only to bless and guide us, but also to correct us and to shield us from false teaching. Among Christian leaders today, there is a widespread conviction that the life of the church was permanently changed by the COVID-19 pandemic. That people aren't going to come back to worship services. That they're too busy and too mobile today to make weekly worship a priority. So individual and online spirituality is the wave of the future, they say. And any congregation that wants to survive needs to hop on board yesterday. Perhaps they're right. But count me skeptical about that faddish trend as well. In a world as electronically centered as ours is, it's obviously valuable to have an online presence. But the witness of Acts 2 and the entire history of Christianity make an airtight case that there is no substitute for coming together to hear God's word, to baptize new believers, to receive the Lord's Supper, to pour out our prayers to God, and to support one another through all the joys and sorrows of life. Gatherings like this, as old-fashioned as they may seem in today's digital world, are where the Holy Spirit has always done his work and continues to do that saving work. There's just no way around it. And no doubt about it. By the grace and mercy of God, this is essential church. In the name of Jesus. Amen.
Christians, we confess together the ancient faith of the church using the words of the Apostles' Creed as they're printed in the order of service. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated as we continue to worship God now using our tithes and gifts and offerings. Insert. It uh, notes the sad news of the death of Gary Hoffman. We uh, lift up his family in our prayers. Uh, the visitation for Gary will be this afternoon here at the church, starting at 4 o'clock, and then his funeral is also here tomorrow morning. Let us bow our hearts and heads together in prayer. Oh Lord, our gracious God, 
We thank you for the gift of the church, for connecting us together as your people, incorporated into the one body of Christ. We thank you for sustaining the church through the centuries and pray that you will continue to sustain it today. Call and gather all your people around your divine gifts that we may come to you in faith and serve our neighbors in love. Lord, in your mercy. Merciful God, pour out your healing power on all who are ill and in need of your care. We pray especially for Garrett Jensen as he recovers from surgery. Grant strength and renewal to all those who are named on our prayer sheet and to those others for whom we pray now in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, comfort Lois Hoffman and all the family and friends of Gary as they grieve his death. Surround them with your love and sustain in them the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life in Christ Jesus. Grant solace to all whose hearts are heavy with grief and hold those who draw near to the hour of death securely in your great promises. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, by your name, all parenthood is known and defined. We thank you this day for the gift of fathers and the irreplaceable role they play in the lives of their children. In a culture that diminishes fathers in many ways, equip them for this crucial service and grant that they may pattern their paternal service on your love for Christ Jesus, your only begotten Son. Lord, in your mercy. Creator God, you provide so richly and steadfastly for all your creatures. As our economy is plagued by inflation and soaring expenses, continue to grant your people all that they need, especially those who are facing economic hardship. We pray, Lord, for the welfare of our nation in the midst of violence, confusion, immorality, and overweening pride. Humble us as a people and draw us back to willing obedience to your ways of life that alone bring true blessing. Lord, in your mercy. All of these things, O Lord, the prayers that flow from our hearts and those greater gifts that only you know that we need, we ask all in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our closing hymn is number 365, Built on a Rock.
serve the Lord. 